get going. Uh, Mark is uh, down the hall and will be here in a second. We are trying to do a lot in a short time. Uh, my name is Pete Westover. My firm is Conservation Works, and Chris Curtis, who's uh, coordinating the conference, is my colleague. And um, what, we're, what we're talking about today is uh, green, green communities. There's a lot going on around the state. Some of you may be familiar with Springfield's Regreen uh, Springfield program, which among other things is planting trees all over, all over the city to help uh, ameliorate the, you know, the heat islands and the urban warming, urban uh, high temperatures. And among other things, uh, I think it's something like 50% of the low-income families, households in Springfield have no air conditioning. So this is not just an inconvenience, this is a matter of health and survival. Um, so let me read the bios of the three speakers. We have some really knowledgeable folks. Mark Lubinsky first is the Western Regional Coordinator for the Mass Department of Energy Resources Green Communities Program. Mark is a native of Western Mass and has over a decade of experience working on projects related to renewable energy, energy efficiency, and alternative transportation. He earned a, a BBA in finance from UMass in Amherst and an MS in Sustainable Systems. And here's Mark, and I'll give you the mic in just a minute. Um, Where is that from mic? the U University of Michigan in Ann Arbor. Mark lives with his wife and two boys in Amherst. Uh, Ann Capra will go second. I've worked with, with Ann on various projects for years and years, and uh, it's always fun. Um, and among other things, is an Asheville resident. She's also the Director of Planning and Conservation in the Town of South Hadley, and previously held the position of Conservation Administrator and Planner. She has 21 years of experience, that much? Um, as a land use and environmental planner. Prior to joining the Town of South Hadley, she was a partner with a private planning firm called Conservation Works, <laughs> and a principal planner with the Pioneer Valley Planning Commission. She's also served as adjunct faculty at the Conway School. And then um, third will be Bob Armstrong, who is here and retired from a life working with computers and teaching math, now busy with Franklin County, continuing the Political Revolution Climate Change Task Force on the Conway Select Board, Conservation Commission, and Cable Advisory Committee. Conway's rep to our local TV stadium, uh, studio, FCAT, and working for local politi political candidates. Okay, so we will start, and I'll hand the mic off to Mark to make this work. So they're re recording, so that's why we need this. So you put that in your pocket and that on your shirt. And um, either I can advance this for you, or if you want to stand here, yeah, you stand can. There. So it's just going to be the down arrow. Oh, nice. Skip some sure. Sure. So 15 minutes each, and I'll give you a little warning. I'll give you a three minute warning. Okay. okay. Yeah, sounds good. Can you hear me okay? Mm -hmm. yeah. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Mark Rabinsky. I'm the Western Regional Coordinator for the Green Communities Program. I've been in this position for a little over two years. Some of you might have known my predecessor, Jim Barry, who had been in the position for a uh, hundred years or so. <laughs> Jim, was, Jim was great. Um, uh, so um, I'm here to talk about uh, the Green Communities Program, and then um, also they wanted me to talk a little bit about schools and regional school districts, us being in a regional school district right now, and how, um, how green communities can interact with, with schools. So. Uh, Green Communities is the, we think of ourselves as the hub for um, all cities and towns, not just designated green communities, um, to help identify if you have questions about energy, energy use, um, uh, or kind of your connection to the, the DOER. Uh, as <clears throat> um, Representative Blaze and Senator Comerford have mentioned, we have 280 green communities right now. Um, Franklin County has done wonderful job. I think just Leiden and Monroe are the, the only ones left, but um, uh, really all of Western Mass has always been really green, which is which is great. Hoping, hoping to get that Hadley one soon. Um, so the qualifications for becoming a green community, some of you may have known this, Green Communities Act was created um, over 10 years ago, probably a dozen years ago now. Um, so there are five criteria in becoming a green community. The first one is adopt an as of right siting for renewable energy generation, um, research and development, or manufacturing. So what that means is that you have to locate areas within your community 
to make them um, as of right. So if you own that property, it's it's it, it's your right to make um, to site either a renewable energy generation, uh, like solar, like a solar field, um, research and development, or a research and development facility, or a manufacturing facility. And then criteria number two goes with criteria one. Uh, the the permitting process for criteria one would be an expedited permitting process, which means it has to take place in under one year. And um, my predecessor, Jim, used to say only Boston would think that one year is expedited permitting because <laughs> normally we, we can do things a lot faster than that. So the um, criteria number three is, is, is a little, not, not more complicated, but kind of a meatier one. Um, it's to create an energy reduction plan and then a plan to re reduce your energy use by 20% within five years. So um, part of that is taking account of how much energy that you use. And we offer a tool called Mass Energy Insight to um, so the town can add all of its municipal energy data. And it's not all of the, all of the energy that the town uses. Um, we're only looking at the municipal energy use. So we're not looking at residential commercial energy use. We're only looking at the, um, the municipal use. So your town hall, your schools, your, um, your, your library, your senior center, and then we're also looking at your vehicles, um, your street lights, your wastewater treatment plant. Um, all of those should be added to Mass Energy Insight, which is our online tool. It's kind of our, our tracking tool for tracking your energy use. And then as a part of that, you create a plan, you create a document that shows how you're gonna reduce your uh, energy use within 20, by 20% within five years. <clears throat> and you'll, your supporting documents for that would be energy audits saying, yes, we've identified that you're going to move your street lights to LED lights, or you're going to um, remove your oil HVAC system and convert to, um, to a heat pump system. So those are some of the, the um, the energy conservation measures that you can adopt to reduce your energy use within those five years. Now we're not saying you have to reduce it within five years. We're saying that we do, you just need to show us a plan that shows you can reduce it within five years by 20%. Number four is adopt a fuel efficient vehicle policy. This is really the one focused on, on, on vehicles. And we have, I'll show you later, we have a list of um, of uh, different size vehicles and the miles per gallon that we want those vehicles to uh, attain when you purchase them. So um, all the vehicles that are owned by the, by the community, if it falls within one of those areas, then it, um, it would need to meet a certain miles per gallon. There are exempt vehicles within there, like if the vehicle is over 8,500 pounds, that's an exempt vehicle, so it doesn't need to meet the criteria. Um, right now, as of this moment, emergency vehicles, like police vehicles, are exempt from that until they're commercially available, or we're starting to see that they're commercially available, so that is going to, that, that, that's gonna go away soon. Um, and then, criteria number five is to minimize the life cycle costs in new construction, um, i.e. adopt the stretch code. So a community has to adopt the stretch code, um, the stretch energy building code, in order to become a green community. Um, so, yeah. Um, so I mentioned Mass Energy Insight. Mass Energy Insight is an online tool that we use to track the community's energy data. Um, we work with the utilities, National Grid Air Source, to get all of the, um, to, so they can upload their, um, their bills to Mass Energy Insight, and you can see the energy use, so you don't have to keep entering those in every month. The only thing we can't enter in is um, delivered fuels, like like if you have oil delivered, propane. Um, some communities use uh, uh, wood pellets, wood chips, um, uh, and then your your gasoline and, and diesel fuel. Um, those aren't automatically uploaded because there's too many small suppliers for those. So we only work with the, the large suppliers. So it makes it a little bit easier, but there still is some work the community has to do in order to upload those. And then there's a lot of tracking. There's a lot of reports that you can run off of that. You can see how much energy you're using. Um, it's really neat sometimes because we can identify problems with buildings. You know, it's like, why did your, why did your energy use go up 20% at this facility um, uh, uh, compared to last year? And they'll say, oh, like we have a motor going or, or um, our, we, 
where our setback um, didn't didn't run. The past few years, um, you can imagine, have been pretty crazy with with COVID, and especially some buildings shutting down completely. Other buildings are running their um, their their air refresh rate um, much more often, so they're actually using more energy. So it's been a little bit. Uh, it's been a little bit crazy this, these past few years when you're looking at the energy data, but it's still neat to see, nevertheless. Um, and you can't you can't ever make predictions on something unless you can track it too. So it's 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 a fun system. I, I love mass energy insight and seeing all the how much energy the towns are using. Kind of a, a data nerd when it comes to that, so it's fun. Mark, can I ask a quick question? Yeah. yeah. Can you look up uh, regions too, or is it just a town by town? So. Um, if, if you have access to it, so the, the town um, select board or manager, however they're set up, or mayor would have to provide you access to it to oh. be able to see it. Um, uh, so some energy committees have access to it, some um, regional planning agencies have access to it. But when you're in there, you can actually compare like the some buildings. So as you say like, how does my school compare to um, like the, the statewide schools? And one thing that we look at, it's think of it like miles per gallon per per school. Like so it's a miles per gallon per like when you're thinking about a building, and we look at it as um, kBTU per square foot. So that's that's thousand BTU British thermal units. That's energy. How much energy per square foot does this building use? And that's a good way to compare one building to another. And there are there are ranges for buildings. And if you're using a lot more than another building, there might be. There might be reasons for that. Maybe you're a technical school and you're running a lot of machinery or, or equipment. You know, there might be reasons for it. Maybe you have more computer equipment. Maybe, or maybe you're just managing your your energy poorly and you have to have better control systems in there. Or maybe you're open for night school. There's a lot of different reasons, but um, uh, there are ways to kind of look at at the state and compare it to certain buildings that you have. Um, so one of the big advantages of the green communities, why green communities become green communities, is because we offer funding. Um, when a community becomes a green community, they receive a, a designation award, um, and that designation award is based on the size of the community, so the population, and then also there's a, um, there's a factor in there for um, uh, like income level within the community that we also we also factor in. So it's the minimum you can receive as a community is $125,000. A lot of communities out our way, usually in the, the between 125 and 200, um, like a, like Springfield and I think Boston and Worcester, they're, they're up, upwards a lot more cause just because they have so much larger populations. And then once you become a green community and, and you've spent out that designation award, you can apply for competitive grants. And we have, um, we've, we've offered competitive grants every year since the program started. Um, at the beginning, they were $250,000 a community. There's a lot more green communities now, so the, the pie's been, the money stays the same, but the, the slice of the pie is shrinking a little bit. So it's, we reduce it to $200,000. And then communities that have received over $750,000 of competitive grant awards, they can only apply for $100,000 in, in competitive grants. Um, the next slide. So here's a, a little bit about our I talked about the, the base rate is $125,000 plus a population per capita income kicker formula. The, the lowest that we um, awarded was, was Chillmark, which is, I think, on, on Nantucket. Martha's Vineyard. Martha's Vineyard, yeah. Right. Um, and then, yeah, Nantucket's like its own. And then um, uh, Boston received a million dollars. Um, so annually up to $200,000 in competitive grants. We've awarded nearly 145 million in designation and competitive grants. Um, they've gone towards a lot of different projects, LED street lights, some solar PV. This is a this is one that we don't often fund anymore because we really want the communities to focus more on energy efficiency. There's no point in putting solar PV on your house if if you're you're nothing's tight in the in the in the building, you know, if you still have air leakage in a really inefficient system, there's no point in putting solar. So we're really focusing on on energy efficiency right now. Um, we, we funded a lot of lights in the beginning. We're really pulling back from LED lighting too because um, we're just not seeing the savings. We're, we're trying to focus more on, on heating um, really and, and any kind of like thermal energy load and converting from 
uh, propane or oil into electrification is something that the, the state as a whole is, is the Commonwealth is really focused on. Um, 619 grants, okay, all the information on there. We, we still um, make use of the utility incentives too. So the communities still have to apply for whatever utility incentives are available. That really makes our grant dollars go a lot further. Um, so here's the communities around us. Conway was designated in um, 2012. They received about $140,000, and they, they spent that out. They haven't come in for a competitive grant since then. Um, Deerfield received their uh, designation grant for $142,000, and they've received two competitive grants since then, 166 and, and 165,000, um, most recently in 2020. I think the 2021 was, they're working on their, their streetlight conversion. Um, Sunderland, is done well too, 146 as their, as their designation grant in 2012. And they've come in for two competitive grants since then. Um, and then Waitley received a $137,000 designation grant in 2012. A lot of 2012s for this, for this region. And then they came in for um, a competitive grant in 2017 for 164. So even though the, the limit was probably 250 or at least 200, um, then you know the community doesn't always come in for the whole thing. They just come in for whatever makes sense for them. Mark, three minutes. Okay, thanks. I'm definitely not hanging through this. So, um, is that three minutes for questions too? Uh, one or two questions, and then we'll we'll have the questions afterwards. Okay. Um, so, I'm, I'm, I'm gonna stop here on the last slide. One of the things um, that Green Communities does really well is 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 looking at all of the, the energy load for, for your municipality. But in the beginning, one thing we didn't mandate was bringing in your regional schools. And the reason being is that they're regional. You know, they could cross um, different, they could, part of it could be in another green community. Um, and then you don't really have full responsibility for that regional school district. You, you really have like a proportional responsibility for it because like Deerfield, you know, I don't know the exact numbers, but maybe, yeah. maybe only 70% of, yeah. of, of Deerfields goes to that. So. One thing that we're focused on a lot is bringing in the regional schools now. And it, has, it doesn't have to be a regional type um, approach to it. Really one community can say we want to bring in the regional schools, but there's, there's a process to it. It can take a little while because we need to update MEI. Um, and for a lot of the past historical use of that building, you need to conduct energy audits to show that there is energy savings opportunities within those regional schools um, in order so that you can still meet that 20% within those five years. Um, and then you need to rewrite and reapprove your energy reduction plan um, by both the select board and the, um, the school board and superintendent. Also, the, the school system, the school board and superintendent need to adopt the, um, uh, the vehicle policy, the fuel efficient vehicle policy, saying that they're only gonna buy certain fuel efficient vehicles. Um, and then they also need to adopt the, the energy reduction plan as well. So um, there's a process. We've, we're working with the RPA, so your RPA would be FERCOG out here to do that. So they have some limited funding to, to work to help the, the towns um, bring in the regional school district. But it's something that I'd love to talk to you more about and um, hopefully hopefully get it done too. Well, thank you. It's nice to be here. My name is Ann Capra. I'm the Director of Planning and Conservation for the Town of South Hadley. And uh, I'm going to talk to you about a tree program that we implemented last year um, with um, Municipal Vulnerability Preparedness Grant, something that we heard about a little bit um, in the plenary this, um, this morning. So, um, let me so, yeah. So, um, basically, um, uh, South Hadley became an MVP community um, a couple years ago, and we've gotten, um, this was our first action grant. Um, it was an FY21 action grant that um, funded this project. Um, so our total grant amount was 105000 um, and the MVP program has a 25% match requirement, and so some of that can be cash, and some of it can be in-kind, um, in-kind labor. And so in our case, we mostly used um, labor. But the tree planting program itself, um, the grant was 15,000 went towards that, and then we had a local match of 10,500. And so the program was implemented 
both um, through my department, which is planning and conservation, the conservation commission, um, the tree committee, the DPW, and um, in South Hadley, we have something called our volunteer conservation core. We have over a thousand acres of town owned conservation mm -hmm. land, um, which is really difficult to manage and take care of. So um, uh, five years ago when I started working for the town, we started this volunteer conservation core. And so we call up our residents and they help us take care of trails and trees and things like that. So, um, so they were a big part of that. And so basically our timeline, um, which was kind of stipulated by our grant. We got our award in June of 2020, and we had all of our trees out by May of 2021. And so I'm basically gonna run through the mechanics of how we did that program. Um, the reason the MVP program funded us is because um, trees are considered a nature-based solution, right? And so there's, I was thinking this morning when we were here in the plenary that I should have had a slide in here that says, why trees, mm -hmm. um, you know, and so, they're both an adaptation and a mitigation strategy. Um, trees sequester carbon, they help mitigate um, the heat island effect, they um, store water both in their canopy and in the roots, and they help um, you know, manage some of the negative effects of you know, say high precipitation rates. They they can manage, you know, erosion and runoff and that sort of thing. And so and they're pretty dear to our hearts, you know, for me. Um, trees, it was like a no-brainer. I was like, oh, I'm gonna plant trees. Um, and it was also, we were um, doing this program during COVID and I thought, you know, with this crisis that we're all facing, planting trees, this is gonna be something that people wanna do. It's gonna be something that's just gonna feel good and I bet you I'm gonna be able to get folks to do it. So um, our campaign was plant 500 trees South Hadley. Um, I originally, the campaign was plant 1,000 trees. But um, the MVP program and my boss were like, you're never gonna get people to plant a thousand trees. And I was like, oh yeah? So fine, we'll, we'll plant 500 trees will be our campaign. But the MVP program left us enough money to plant a thousand trees. Um, and we planted um, about 800. So it was kind of like, we kind of got in the, the middle. But um, so we started out um, that um, in the summer of uh, 2020, um, I designed these promotional flyers to just kind of get the word out. We um, set up a website which was on the materials and we um, you know, had our, our um, contact information and so forth. And so I'm just gonna go through what those, what those materials are. And um, the first was our, um, our tree program catalog. So we made 13 species available to folks. Um, already um, I knew when I set this up that I was gonna work with New England Wetland Plants who were then in Amherst but um, that year they actually relocated their nursery to South Hadley. So they bought an old um, old horse farm in South Hadley and they relocated there. And, and uh, we had a great relationship with them. I've worked with them for years. I knew they had really good quality stock. I knew I didn't want to do bare roots. Um, and so um, I knew I could buy potted plants from them. So I worked with them right off the bat and said, what could you supply next spring? And we um, figured out you know, what they had for stock and, um, and generated our, our catalog for our program from, from them. And this is all basically, um, you know, right out of their catalog, but I created this little um, uh, our tree catalog form, which was a PDF that was online. Um, and you could look at the different species. They were all native um, tree canopy species. The, um, you know, we also have um, a service berry in there, which is, you know, an understory, but I think everything else was a canopy, a native canopy tree. Um, what size the stock was gonna be, you know, um, in the two gallon pots, they were either three to four feet or um, four to six feet when you bought them, so they were nice sized plants. Um, and then what their conditions were for growing, um, you know, sun, shade, and then, you know, what the soil conditions, dryer sites, you know, weather sites, et cetera. Um, so that was um, put out there right away. Um, we uh, promoted the, um, the program through the local newspapers. This was our ad that ran. We have um, the Town Reminder in South Hadley. It publishes every Friday, so we ran this ad a number of um, weeks. Orders were due by, I think it was December 1st, so of that year, because um, that's when the nursery said, you know, we need, you know, let us know right in December and we can get, you know, we'll have everything ready for you in the spring. Um, we did a promotional video with our local cable access, which was a lot of fun, and that ran on cable access, like before and after um, town board meetings. As you know, we were all 
meeting virtually during that period. So we were watching a lot of cable access TV in addition to Netflix. Um, and, um, and it was on our town website. Um, and um, we promoted the website, which had all the information on our town website. We have a pretty active um, news and alerts. And then, excuse me, we also you know had Facebook, et cetera. So we really promoted all of that. And then civic organizations and school newsletters. The school really helped push it all out too. So um, it was widely publicized. Um, this is um, our tree order form. So this was a Google form. So once you knew what trees you wanted, you went on into the Google order form and you, you placed your order. Um, we basically didn't limit the number of trees you could order, but it was five per species. So you could order up to five per species. Um, I didn't want to have a lot of rules and regulations. Um, I don't like them. And I thought that people would be more inclined to just order trees if they could kind of you know go hog wild. But you did have to commit to um, taking care of the trees. So there was a box where you said, I'm going to order these trees and I'm going to take care of them. Um, and then there was also a box that said, um, are you, um, do you need help planting your trees? Um, and um, we asked that people plant their own trees unless they were physically unable. And if you weren't able, then um, the volunteers in, um, you know, from the Conservation Corps, the tree committee, um, were going to go out and plant them for you or deliver them to you. Um, How big were the trees? They were between um, three feet and six feet in two gallon pots. So they were, they were um, you know, it was easy to plant them, um, but some people, you know, just weren't able. And so we, we made, we helped uh, people get that done. Um, so we um, had orders of 778 trees were ordered through the program, and that was on 154 different properties in town. And so, um, I'll show you this slide. So these um, dots here are the properties around town that ordered trees and had trees planted. Um, through the MVP program, we they have a social justice focus, and so um, we guarantee that at least half of the plants would be planted in census tracts in our community that had the lowest median income. And those are in the southern half of town. I don't know how familiar you are with South Hadley. Most people really only know about Mount Holyoke College and the Village Commons. But as you move south, this is South Hadley Falls, across the river is Holyoke. And so, um, you know, the median incomes um, are, move lower, they're lower as you move south in town. So we met that goal and we got trees planted not only in that part of town, but throughout town. So we were pretty happy about that. Um, and so, um, what else did we do? So um, you ordered your trees, um, I confirmed your orders, and then we had a tree pickup day, it was on Saturday, May 1st, and it was fantastic. Um, we, the trees, so New England wetland plants came in box trucks and they delivered all of our trees the day before. So we only had one day to take care of them and make sure they were watered. And fortunately, um, our DP director, Chris Bouchard, loves plants too, loves trees. Um, he's the tree warden in his hometown um, in the Hilltown. So he was thrilled to do this even if we had to have them for longer. But that's really critical. If you're gonna order these trees and have them ready, you have to be able to take care of them. That's why I also didn't want bare roots because if they're much harder, they dry out, they're much harder to take care of and um, you know, less, less um, success rate with them. So we got everything delivered at the DPW and then um, I made these little signs by species and we grouped our plants so they were there. And then I had volunteers lined up um, so that the day that the people came to pick up their plants, you know, the volunteers could pull them. And so the way that that worked is, um, I sent out um, an, an email with another Google form and confirmed everyone's order and said, sign up for a half hour slot between eight and 12 on May 1st for when you wanna come and get your plants. Um, so that I kind of just structured. Again, it was during COVID. Um, we were concerned about social distancing, so we were trying to set that up um, to, you know, to, to, to make people feel safe um, coming through. And so um, you had your half hour slot um, and I had printouts of everyone's order you know, by name, and I was at the gate, people pulled up, um, they told me who they were, I gave them their form, they drove up, they gave their form to one of our volunteers, and then the volunteer would pull all their plants from the grouping, help them get them in the truck, and, or their car, whatever they pulled up in, and then they um, pulled up, and um, they everyone could get a couple bags of compost. We wow. bought um, these, um, I guess they're one cubic foot 
of um, really nice <coughs> compost, um, which we ordered from Hadley Garden Center, and that also came the day before on pallets, so that everything was, you know, didn't have to be stored for very long. People got a couple bags of compost. Again, I didn't limit it, you know, take as many as you want. People were very reasonable. Um, people also got a little handout about how to plant containerized trees, you know, made by Arbor Day Foundation, um, which was a nice little reminder. Most people were pretty familiar um, with how to plant a tree, but nonetheless, they got that. Three minutes, yeah. Yep. And then, um, and then everyone went home on Saturday, May first, and we planted almost, you know, 800 trees. Wow. Um, we were really fortunate because it was a nice cool day and as you all know we had a lot of rain last summer so it was really a great year to, to put in all these trees um pretty soon you'll know whether they survived the first winter <laughs> yeah um and i'm hopeful i'm going to get a little bit of money this summer for an intern and i'm going to have him track and uh call up everyone who got trees and try and get a handle on what the survivability rate was and you know where things were at with all of this so we can start and also um start using uh, probably one of the apps like uh, eTree um, to kind of get a sense of, you know, what the impact is on um, on climate, you know, carbon sequestration, et cetera, over time with this program. Because, I, you know, I love data too. It would be really fun to, to, um, to track that over time. Um, so as I mentioned, our budget um, for, the, for the program was pretty reasonable. Um, so the trees from New England wetland plants were, um, you know, $9,788 um, plus delivery um, to DPW. So that was roughly $12.50 per tree. Um, and then um, we also bought 12 large caliper trees from Amherst Nurseries um, that DPW planted around town. So, um, <coughs> so, and so the cost for the tree plus installation was $362. So we did put in some bigger trees. The compost from Hadley Garden Center was basically $2,400. They didn't charge us delivery because he's a, a local South Hadley resident. Um, and then advertising for the program, we spent just over a grand on that. And then we had to track our labor, our volunteer labor, because it's part of the MVP requirement. So staff, South Hadley staff, we had 217 hours. And then volunteers, 54 hours, so a total of 271 hours. Um, so our total program cost was um, just over $17,000 plus our in-kind labor. Wow. So all in all, it's a pretty affordable program. Um, so we're, we're pretty pretty um, proud of that. So um, when people came and pick up, picked up their orders, I also had a sheet in there which was our photo contest because I was like, gosh, how am I going to, you know, I, I'm, there's so many people who are going to be planting trees, I'd really like to have some, some pictures of all of that. So we ran a photo contest and the prize was to win Doug Tallamy's um, The Nature of Oaks, which is one of my favorite books. If you haven't read it, um, you will fall in love with oak trees um, and all the insects that, that live on them. They're probably one of our most important canopy trees, um, really all over the world, but in New England in, in New England and the United States. But so, um, and people email me their photos of their, of their trees that they planted. Um, so here's just some of them. This guy here, he won our, he won our contest. He won the book. Um, but um, so lots of people were planting trees, kids and um, adults of all ages. Um, so people had a lot of fun that weekend getting the trees in. Um, and then um, in addition to the, um, the, the promotion that we did through the program, um, we, we did some public education and outreach um, related to our entire grant. Um, the other things we did in our grant was we updated our stormwater management bylaw to make sure um, that when we permits, um, when we issue stormwater permits in South Hadley, we're using the most up-to-date climate science so that so that systems are being sized appropriately, um, particularly um, you know NOAA Atlas 14 or or most recent. Um, and then um, we also did an assessment of culverts across town. So we looked at 55 different culverts in our town. We hired um, a, you know an engineering firm and they were all assessed for um, structural integrity and ecological resiliency. Um, in our current um, MVP action grant, we are um, looking at 100% um, design for two of them as well as a dam removal um, you know, in, our, in our current MVP grant. But so those are the other pieces. And so for each one of those pieces, we committed to some public education and outreach. And so we created this climate resiliency web page on the town's website and we um, 
basically just um, posted a lot of information, but we ran, again, because it was during COVID, we had um, a number of presentations by experts that were videoed, and then you know you could watch them on the website or cable access ran them for us too. But the one particularly about um, trees and climate change was done by um, BSC, which is a consulting group. And honestly, I, it was one of the best presentations I've ever seen um, about trees and climate. And so I highly, this is a topic that interests you, I highly recommend um, you check it out. Um, but you can go on the Town of South Hadley's website and um, Google Climate Resiliency and it will get you to this page and you can view these. And I'd be happy to um, you know, give you links if you wanna put them on your municipality's website. Um, but so, and that was our program. Uh, 15 minutes, I don't know how you do anything in 15 minutes. Uh, I'm shocked, I have too many slides. Um, so about five years ago, at the end of the Bernie campaign, we formed a group, FCCPR and Greenfield, and we were looking to look at a lot of the things that we liked about the Bernie campaign and how to continue doing that. And we formed a climate change, and, and the group consists of task, for, task forces. And one of them was a climate change task force. And I chaired the climate change task force. And then we had meetings and we talked about what did we want to work on. So one of the projects I wanted to work on was something I had recently heard about, and this is about 2017, was municipal aggregation. And to me, this group of people from towns all around Franklin County was the perfect group to work on it because we wanted to try to form a large municipal aggregation of towns all across Franklin County. All of our towns were too little to do it as one town, but we could do it as a group. And so we had to do a lot of learning because we didn't really know what it was and that was a lot of fun. And then uh, um, we have, then we implemented it and it's now something that exists. We're in about a year and a half into our second contract and it's gonna continue. And so um, one of the things we're gonna learn about in all of these workshops today are what can we do? And I like this one because this one is relatively easy going forward. A lot of towns had to do some hard work back during the late, uh, you know, 2018, 2019, which meant uh, passing a resolution in your town meeting and getting your select board to support this. And we all went and met with a lot of select boards and that was fun too. Uh, sort of like herding cats. You can't believe what it's like, all the select boards. And, uh, and, and then, and, um, like all municipal projects, it's gonna require all of us to continue leaning on our select boards to understand what's happening with your town's aggregation and whether you like your aggregation, whether you want it to be different than it is now, what, what your town is looking for in the way of the electricity that you purchase. So I'm gonna to talk today a little bit about purchasing electricity. There's a lot of words that have to do with electricity that a lot of people don't really understand very well unless you were an electrical engineer, and, and we're not gonna go there. And then we're gonna talk about what's in aggregation and what are the alternatives, what are the other ways you can purchase electricity. We all purchase electricity, but how does that happen? Down arrow? The down arrow, yeah. Okay, so electricity is important. We all buy electricity. Our homes use a lot of electricity. Um, we may use electricity and other things, y you know, uh, w we have heating systems in our homes, but they all also use electricity. They might use fossil fuels, but they have pumps and motors and thermostats and all kinds of other things that run on electricity. Some people have air conditioners in their home. So, so electricity is important to all of us. We all buy it. And we're all especially the people who are here at this meeting, interested in lowering our carbon footprint, interested in lowering the amount of carbon that we're pumping up into the atmosphere. That was that, that UMass professor's talk was, if we have high emissions and low emissions, we need to lower our carbon emissions. And so how do we lower our carbon emissions? Well, the biggest one is we stop using fossil fuels. But, you know, that doesn't mean that you can convince people to stop doing anything. And so, so people are gonna to continue to do things and they're gonna do things by converting everything to electricity. And the reason is, is that electricity can be generated without fossil fuels. So, so we, need to convert, we need to convert to electric cars. 
I have an electric car. They work great. There's going to be some out in the parking lot here. Drive an electric car. Make your next car purchase at least seriously consider buying an electric car. You probably have a, a some kind of stove you cook on in your house in your kitchen. It might work run on propane. Mine does. I really want to convert my stove to an electric stove. When I do that, then I won't have any propane in my house anymore. Um, convert your house to electric heat. So all of these things are the way that we use fossil fuels, but you can convert them to electricity, and then we need to make sure that we continue to push the electric generation in New England to renewable sources. So, uh, where are we now? Um, so, I, I was saying this talk is gonna be about buying electricity, but as I wrote it, I kept getting sidetracked. And so, how do we get our electricity? Some people here probably have solar panels in their home. And so there, you're not buying that electricity, um, but you probably still are buying some electricity. You're probably still connected to the electric grid. If you don't, your panels don't make enough electricity, you then draw some from the grid. So that's the additional electricity you use in addition to what you get from your solar panels. So if you don't have solar panels, you use all the electricity from the grid, but even if you do, you still draw some electricity from the grid. Um, the grid is owned by Eversource or National Grid, and, uh, and they deliver all of that electricity to you, and no matter how you buy your electricity, they will be the company that sends you your bill, they know how much your electricity costs, no matter who you buy it from, they bill you for it, and they charge you for the distribution system that they own and that they use to bring it to your house. So this talk is mainly about the additional electricity, not about solar panels. I would love to talk about solar panels, but the talk is about the additional electricity that you're drawing from the grid and that your home is using. So, when we think about electricity, we measure it in certain units. So we first of all, we talk about electric current. Electric current is the flow of, of electricity through a wire. Doesn't matter what voltage it's at, it's just flowing through a wire. We talk about current. In your house, you have either circuit breakers or you might have a fuse box. It's a little device that measures how much electricity is flowing through the wire and, and uh, you like, you'd have a 15 amp fuse. So that's, that's amperage, it's the current of electricity. We also talk about the volts of electricity. So volts is from between two poles, now we're talking about two separate poles, how many uh, volts of electricity there are. You know, if you have a, a D cell battery, it's about, about a volt and a half. If you have one of those square little batteries, it's about nine volts. We have plugs in the wall, they are at 110 volts. So there's the voltage of the electricity that you're using, and if you take the current multiplied by the voltage, that's called the watts, the power, the, the, the number of watts of electricity that that's generating. So we might talk about a 100 watt bulb. That would be a bulb that when you plug it into a socket, 110 volts at, 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 uh, at one amp, it would be a 100 watt bulb. 100, right, one amp times 100 volts is 100 watts. Okay, this is all good? Yep. Now we also talk about, so you measure your electricity when you buy it in kilowatt hours. So watts, 100 watt light bulb, if we have 10 100 watt light bulbs, that's 1,000 watts. Or you can have 100 10 watt light bulbs, or you can have 1,000 one watt, uh, one watt light bulb. They're all a thousand watts. That's a kilowatt. And if you burn a kilowatt for an hour, that's called a kilowatt hour. So in your house, if you have 10 100 watt light bulbs and they're on for an hour, that's, that's one kilowatt, okay? Now, most of our homes draw 500 kilowatt hours of electricity from the grid or from somewhere a month. So it's just it's the amount of electricity we all use. Uh, what else? Okay. Um, what was I trying to talk about here? So, 
so, so we draw electricity from the grid and there is an organization that is interested in making sure they measure how much electricity collectively all of New England is drawing from all of our grid and then they make sure that that amount of generation is happening. And if, if, if we were all drawing electricity from the grid and there wasn't enough electricity being pumped into the system, then the voltage would go down. We would have a brownout. Or if there was a more gender, more electricity being pumped in, then the voltage is liable to rise. We'd start popping circuits and we would have a problem. So, so there's a group called ISO New England, the independent system operator of New England, and they do all of New England, Maine, New Hampshire, Vermont, Massachusetts, Connecticut, Rhode Island, I think that's it. So they, they're responsible for looking at the amount of electricity that we're all drawing, and in a second by second process, they are turning on electric generation, turning off electric generation. I think of them as being the orchestra leader. You know, they're, they're, all of the time it's happening very dynamically. And they, when they, when they, they're interested in turning on as much as possible the cheapest generation first. So they have received bids from electric generators that say, I will provide this much electricity. Now sometimes you might order a town or, a, or, a, or an electricity purchaser might say, we're gonna get so much electricity from a nuclear power plant and it's gonna run all the time. Or there are some people that own a hydro dam and they say, we'll generate electricity anytime you need it and they get turned on and off dynamically by ISO New England. So, purchasing electricity. There's three ways you can purchase your electricity. One is you can have Eversource purchase it for you. That's the way it normally is when you sign up and you get an account with Eversource and they, they buy electricity on your behalf. They estimate how much you're probably gonna use because they don't know who you are. And over time, they get to know you as a customer and they know about how much electricity you're gonna use. And they purchase enough electricity from generators to pump into the grid on your behalf. And, and that's, that's the way it was up until, I'll say, recently. Now another is, you can sign a contract with what's called an independent supplier, an independent private supplier. I know everybody here has gotten letters from independent private suppliers that say buy electricity from us. And you know, you know it's, it's legal. That is it, is, it is in our laws that that is a legal way for you to buy electricity. To give you a hint as to how good a way that is to buy electricity, for the last two legislative sessions, our Attorney General has submitted legislation to remove those laws. Mm -hmm. They are so full of fraud. If somebody comes to your house trying to sell you electricity, they may you know, just say, well, let's look at you for an example, and they may try to talk you into you giving them your Eversource account number, and they'll look you up, and they might talk about how much electricity you buy. You probably are gonna become a customer of that independent supplier without signing anything. They, they, they are so fraudulent and poor Maura Healy can't find a way to regulate them. There are a lot of other states that are trying to regulate them. She, the only way she knows to regulate them is to remove those laws and making it illegal. Um, and then the third way is that your town can buy your electricity on your behalf. So this may feel a lot like the private competitive supply, <coughs> but, it's, but it's our town's doing it, your select board is watching over it, the laws are very different. For example, um, um, so uh, I'll, I'll come back to a little more detail on each of those in a minute. But so if your utility supplies it for you, the utility has laws it has to follow. It goes out for bid twice a year. So we have two prices for our electricity that we get charged by the utility. They have a winter price and a summer price. Usually the summer price is lower than the winter price. And so here's some examples of what, what our utility charged us for electricity in the, the winter price and then the summer price, 2018. It's always usually a little lower in the summer price. And right now you'll notice in the summer price last year was about nine and a half cents per kilowatt hour. They announced the winter price 13.73. So many of you have noticed, oh my God, my electricity bill went way up. 
and it went way up because Eversource raised their price. They can just set up whatever they want. Every six hmm. months. Every six months, yeah. So there's no structured way they do that? They just do it? Yeah, the DPU. The DPU, DPU says, yes. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> and they go out for a band a couple months before, a month or two before, like in, in uh, November maybe, they announce what their winter price is going to be, and it becomes the price on January 1st. Wow, three more minutes. Uh, I know, oh geez. <laughs> uh, so, so competitive supply, so the real problem with competitive supply is you sign up with competitive supply, you sign a two-year contract, they tell you what the price will be for the first six months. They don't give you a hint as to what it will be after that, I can tell you, it will go up. <laughs> uh, you can go on your, your Eversource bill, and then you can go to a website on the Eversource bill, and you can look at competitive suppliers that Eversource says are there. And, uh, and so, so I just pulled up the first page of the Eversource alternative suppliers. And these are what they are. So here's Eversource has their own bill here, 13.73. Um, and then we have, um, so I'm in Conway. So in Conway, I see a, what the Conway aggregation, another Conway aggregation. Um, and, and, then, and then there's more and more and more, there's pages of these of alternative suppliers. And you can go there, you can sign up for your own. So I won't go through all this. This is the state, this is, I got this from the state website. It's a description of what's, what is community choice aggregation. The municipality buys it. Um, municipalities can join together. So we've got 13 towns that all join together to buy our electricity. Um, it's, it's all voluntary. People in your town don't have to be part of the aggregation, but they can join if they want. And actually, when you form an aggregation, everybody in your town who is currently an Eversource customer, they're not on private supply, they all become part of the aggregation. And they can then opt out of the aggregation if they want. Um, and, and then Eversource will continue to do your billing. Uh, oh. So these are the 13 towns in our Franklin County aggregation. I can tell you it's a little puzzling to me. There were some towns that expressed absolutely no interest. We could not get Asheville to show any interest whatsoever in our aggregation. You are not part of it. Um, so uh, the, the town of, uh, of, uh, of Montague, no interest. Uh, Leverett was interested, so interested, they said, we don't want to wait for 13 towns to, you know, get together and do it, they made their own. And then it took them a long time to get a low price because it's very difficult when a tiny town goes out for bid to get a low price. Whereas when we go out for bid, we can get the largest suppliers to supply us. Um, we went out to bid for a number of different choices of the electricity we're buying. So we have these choices. We have meets the renewable portfolio standard. So that's what Eversource supplies. It meets whatever the legal minimums are. We can get that plus 5% renewable energy, 25% renewable energy, 50, 100% renewable energy, and then what's called 100% national wind. So these are, all, these are all companies that you can effectively be ordering electricity from. And um, class one, these are all class one additions. They mean made in New England, renewable energy made in New England. This is renewable energy made in Kansas or Texas, usually. So I'm not a big fan of them. Um, so in Conway, as an example, we offer the people of Conway three choices they can choose from. When they got moved into the aggregation, our standard offering is renewable portfolio standard plus 25% more additional renewable energy. And, and we sell that, if you remember, it was, what was the, uh, 13.73 cents per kilowatt hour, we charge 10.29, three cents less than Eversource for their minimum, no additional renewable. We have 25% additional renewable for three cents less than Eversource. If you want the same power that Eversource would give to you, 9.34, almost a nickel cheaper per kilowatt hour than Eversource. And then the yeah, optional green, which is 100% class one, we charge 13.124, still lower than the Eversource price. 
Now, I don't know what the average price is gonna be next summer. These are what our prices are gonna be next summer. The prices are stable for three years. We're in our, this three year contract, but um, it still seems like a good thing. Uh, where are we? Uh, so, how to tell what kind, where you're getting your electricity from. This is a page off my electric bill. So I have solar panels, and this time of year, my solar panels don't always make as much electricity as I use, so I use a little bit of electricity. Eversource charged me $24 for the electricity that I drew from the grid. They charged me $38 just because they own the distribution wires. <laughs> so, so this was my bill, but if you look down here at this point on your bill, it will say who your electricity supplier actually is. So we're getting our electricity from a company called Dynagy. It says Conway Aggregation. So if you live in Buckland, you would say Buckland Aggregation. Deerfield, it would say Deerfield Aggregation. Bob, I think we better stop and go for questions. Okay, so our, our, our broker is a company called Colonial. Uh, you can opt in and opt out at any time. If you're not in the aggregation, if you look at your bill, you're not in the aggregation, you can go to, you can call Colonial, you can go to the Colonial webpage, and you can sign up. I think I'm done. Okay, good. Thank you.